Welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium, along with our partners Shareable and the Kresge Foundation and the Bar Foundation. I'm Professor Julian Adjaman, and together with my research assistants, Perry Scheinbaum and Caitlin McLennan, we organize Cities at Tufts as a cross-disciplinary academic initiative which recognizes Tufts University as a leader in urban studies, urban planning, and sustainability issues. We'd like to acknowledge that Tufts University's Medford campus is located on colonized Wampanoag and Massachusetts traditional territory. Today, we are delighted to welcome Tamika L. Butler. Tamika is a national expert and speaker on issues related to the built environment, equity, anti-racism, diversity and inclusion, organizational behavior and change management. As the principal and founder of Tamika L. Butler Consulting, her focus is on shining a light on inequality, inequity, and social justice. Most recently, she was the Director of Planning, California, and the Director of Equity and Inclusion at Tool Design. Previously, Tamika served as the Executive Director of the Los Angeles Neighborhood Land Trust, a nonprofit organization that addresses social and racial equity, wellness by building parks and gardens in park poor communities across greater LA. She's got a diverse background in law, community organizing, nonprofit leadership, and is currently, I'm delighted to know, pursuing a PhD in urban planning at the University of California, Los Angeles. Tamika received her JD from Stanford Law School and a BA in psychology and BS in sociology at Crichton University in her hometown of Omaha, Nebraska. She lives in Los Angeles with her wife, son, and daughter. Today's talk is transportation inequities, what's data got to do with it? Tamika, a Zoom-tastic welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium. As usual, microphones off and videos off, send questions through the chat function. Thank you, and Tamika, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Thanks for having me, I'm really excited to be here. I'll try to wrap up my comments uh, in about 30 minutes and, and leave plenty of time for questions. Looking forward to, to hearing from you all uh, much more uh, than myself. So with that, <laughs> let me share my screen. Okay, and hopefully that worked. Um, Seeing no feedback that it didn't, I will get started. So I am, like I said, absolutely thrilled to be here um, and to, to talk to you all a little bit about transportation and equities uh, and, and what, what role data plays in that. And so let's get started. Let's just jump right in. So for folks who, who haven't heard me speak before are wondering why I'm here and, and why, uh, why I'm speaking, uh, as, as you heard in my intro a little bit, I'm, I'm Tamika. I love um, bicycling. That's how I got into transportation. I, I personally uh, just started biking and I had a job at the LA County Bicycle Coalition and it really opened up this whole field of urban planning for me. I have to be honest that I, I don't know that I knew urban planning existed. Um, there are so many things about our built environment I just took for granted. Sure, someone was making decisions about how things looked and how things moved and how things worked, but I never really thought about it. And once I was at the Bike Coalition and realized there was this whole field uh, of, of folks, many who, who didn't look like me or have my life experiences planning, um, where we could go and not go and, and who could sit on a park bench and who couldn't and how you build that park bench to make sure some people don't sit there. I knew it was something I, I really wanted to do. And so I had a few jobs at nonprofits, um, had a private consulting job. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, you know, when, when folks ask me who I'm with, I have my own consulting firm, Tamika L. Butler Consulting. And I do a number of things. I work um, with, with agencies. Uh, and and kind of big national organizations. So that first report is one I, I co-wrote um, for NACTO, uh, one of our, our big um, organizations that brings together transportation officials uh, from, from different cities. They have a big conference every year 
Uh, and luckily this year it will be uh, in the in the Boston area. Um, that middle one is, is a report about climate. I do a lot of climate work. Um, yes, uh, transportation is my home and my foundation, but naturally I do a lot of work around um, climate and sustainability. Um, and then also writing a, a, and leading a, a research project um, for another agency like MetroLink, our, our regional uh, commuter uh, rail here, um, and really looking at how they could think about accessibility and affordability post pandemic with a specific focus on fares. Uh, I also do some, some freelance writing for bicycling uh, and, and work with a ton of tech companies um, doing some emerging mobility stuff. And because my background is, is in the nonprofit world, I try to work with as many nonprofits as possible uh, and often help participate in projects or help with writing um, reports about different topics. And then I do things uh, like today where I, I love to speak. It's been a while since I've done one of them in person, um, but I enjoy welcome you, welcoming you all into my home uh, and, and doing them over Zoom. So a lot of folks ask uh, if I'm a planner. And as I said, being a planner is not something I knew about. I was, you know, a kid who got relatively uh, good grades, who had two parents who hadn't gone to college. And they said, you know, be a doctor or a lawyer. So I did. Uh, law school was shorter. So I went to law school. And, and for me, the first time I really started thinking about transportation was as a lawyer. I was working in, in San Francisco in Bayview Hunters Point, one of the historically Black uh, communities there. And uh, I wanted to help everybody with their legal employment um, issues. I worked at a legal aid office helping with employment discrimination. And no one wanted to talk to me until they knew how I felt about SFMTA's new Muni line that was going into Bayview Hunters Point. A lot of folks thought it was just for tourists um, who wanted to see uh, the San Francisco 49ers play at Candlestick, which is located in the community. But a lot of folks didn't think it was for people in the community. Um, and, and really, it was it was the community members in Bayview, the, you know, the church I went to all the time um, and did my, my legal clinic and, and, and got to know the parishioners. It was them that, that helped me understand the way uh, that that transportation is, is our mayor here in LA has sometimes said, transportation is this prism through which we can see all other social issues, right? Um, how do you have uh, economic mobility without mobility? And, and that's something that, that these folks really taught me. Um, and and I, I kind of became a transportation nerd then, but I didn't really get a transportation job until the LA County Bicycle Coalition was hiring. Uh, I had just done AIDS life cycle, a, a 545 mile ride uh, from San Francisco to LA supporting uh, the, the LGBT centers in both cities. Um, and I loved riding my bike. It, you know, Training for that ride reminded me of the freedom I felt on my bike and it made me fall in love with LA. I hated LA, I was here because I had a partner here, um, but being able to explore the city on, on my bike really made me fall in love. And me being hired uh, was, was a big deal. Uh, there, there were some, some blogs written, as, as you can see this one, uh, white smoke rising above the downtown headquarters, a, a reference to the, the Pope, I suggest. Um, those of us who have been part of bike communities know that in bike communities, uh, sometimes we take ourselves pretty seriously. And for me, the LA County Bicycle Coalition, still to this day, best job I ever had. I got to be on my bike every day, wear wrinkled clothes and uh, fit in seamlessly. Um, I helped lead a coalition that, uh, that made LA a Vision Zero city um, when Vision Zero was still relatively new. Uh, and, and our coalition was, was different than in a lot of cities. We had the biking group, we had the walking group, but we had youth organizations, we had uh, affordable housing organizations, we had community land trusts, we had uh, public health organizations. We had um, racial justice, civil rights, like legal organizations. We had a ton of people understanding that folks dying on the street um, was not just a transportation issue. It was a people issue. It was a public health issue. Um, and, and we had to talk about it. And, you know, before our, our mayor decided not to run uh, for president and then to potentially be ambassador of India, I was going to news conferences all the time. Uh, I was helping launch Bike Share uh, in LA, 
and I was one of the the leaders of a campaign to get our our MPO uh, to to really have directed specific spending for active transportation. First time uh, in LA County that a ballot measure had specifically allocated money uh, for biking and walking. And if if that wasn't cool enough, um, because I lived in a place like LA, I got to you know ride a bike. Uh, with our director of transportation uh, and a producer of Mad Men and check out the Emmys. Uh, our, our award ceremony was not as dramatic as, as this last one this last week. There were no slaps, um, but uh, our, you know, our, our life was good. I really enjoyed that job. And then um, there was a council member uh, who, was, who was running for, for council and he was a bike guy. Uh, he owned a bike store. A lot of folks in the bike community loved him. I did not love him so much. He had always been rude to me, um, dismissive of me, sexist, racist. Um, and a lot of folks of color and women of color in the community, when it came out um, that he had been on the dark portions of the interwebs uh, doing and saying all of these things, none of us were surprised because of our interactions with him. What was perhaps a little bit surprising is that it didn't matter to a lot of folks in the transportation community. A lot of folks in the transportation community felt that at the end of the day, he was still gonna make them safer. And if they were gonna feel safe, then they could overlook some of these things he did. And it was, you know, wow, what about those of us who never feel safe in this person's presence? But that didn't matter. Um, it didn't matter at all because people wanted their bike lane. And that was one of the first, you know, times I thought, yo, like this space just might not be for me. I thought about it a lot, but that's when I really felt it in my gut. And I, I always tell people, it's not because I think that all bike people are, are horrible. Uh, I, I just happen to think um, that while bikes don't discriminate, cyclists do, uh, because cyclists are people and people discriminate. And the more I, I got into urban planning and beyond just like this narrow piece of the bike world and really learn more about, you know, just what we do, I just started constantly questioning, is this the widest space I've ever been in? And that's saying a lot, because I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. So if I think that this is, is the widest space I've ever been in, you know, I, I just started looking at the data, right? Um, what is the most common race uh, of, of, you know, urban and regional planners? White folks. White folks are actually more prevalent in the profession uh, than they are in the general population. White people are overrepresented um, amongst planners. And when you think of something like transit, right? Um, who rides and who works at transit agencies. So transit agencies are super important. Uh, they give a lot of jobs, um, but they don't have the same demographics as the people who ride, right? A majority of transit riders are women, people of color, people who are low income, people who aren't just always making lifestyle choices or climate choices, but are really dependent on transit. But the demographics of the people who work there don't match that. When Transit Center, uh, an organization out of New York um, that, that does a lot of great work, I'm, I, I will self-disclose I'm on their board, but when, when they published that, that report a few years ago, women only made up 39% of, of the transit agency workforce. And, and there were less than five transit agency CEOs that were women. There might be a few more now, um, but the boards are still predominantly white, right? And, and some people may say, well, that's, you know, that's transit, that's old school, like the future of transportation is emerging mobility. And, you know, like I said, I do a lot of emerging mobility work. Uh, I'm all in on, on Super Pumped, the Showtime series taking us behind the scenes on Uber uh, right now. You know, I, I, I did a lot of work and have a lot of community in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm on the uh, company. I'm on the board of a, a tech company, a lacuna, that does what I think is great transportation work. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not just transit, right? 
uh, when, when you look at when Uber first released their stats about who made up their company, right? It was more men. It was more white people. No, no different than, than transit. What about when you look at leadership? Uh, the disparities are even greater. And Uber is fun to pick on because uh, they're in the news right now as, as the show is getting a lot of buzz, but it's not just them, right? When you look at Lyft, they may display it differently and want it to be a little harder to follow, um, but the biggest circle is still white folks, right? Um, when you look at leadership, again, biggest circle is still white folks. And, and for me, you know, it's like, yes, this, this might be the whitest space I've ever been in. Nonetheless, right? I love transportation. I love planning. So I, I decided to get my PhD. And when I decided to get my PhD during the pandemic, when theoretically we all decided, let's go back to grad school, I didn't know if I was going to get in anywhere. Um, I, my, my generous uh, introducer um, graciously served as one of my, my reference letter writers. But I, I applied um, to, to a few places because I wasn't sure I was going to get in. But one of the places I applied where I ultimately ended up going was UCLA. And as I do as a student of color, when I was applying to UCLA, I was like, look, I know transit's super white. I know emerging mobility super white. I know that, that transportation can be a really white space. But what's, what's the academy like? If I'm gonna go get my PhD and potentially be part of this academy, what is it like? So, you know, I did my research and, and these, these are, are pictures from, from the website at UCLA when I was applying, right? So front and center, uh, they have this commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. They have a commitment uh, to social justice and to thinking about disparities. Um, they, they show their, their demographics right out front uh, and, and though it, it, it does reflect uh, the highest number, again, being, being white folks, there are a ton of, of, of women there. They even consider non-binary folks. Um, there's, there's Latinx folks and, and African-American folks. And so, you know, maybe I'll be okay. But then I do what I always do. I go to the faculty page and I see how long I have to scroll before I get to somebody who I, you know, think, wow. Is there another black woman? I, I don't I don't see anyone, right? Um, now sure, there is some diversity uh, in in the in the faculty. Um, it's not completely white, but if you look, right, it's still a lot of men. <laughs> it's still a lot of white folks, right? And and that's just that's just what it is, right? Um, and so when I think is transportation and, and more broadly, right, because that's not just transportation faculty, that's all faculty. When I think is this a white space, absolutely it is, right? And so what does that mean for those of us who want to do planning work? And again, not just transportation work, but feel like we're, we're young and we're gifted and, you know, I used black here because I'm black, but fill in whatever group of oppressed people. How do we think about what this will be for us once we're in school, when we get out of school? How do we think about advancing, right? Um, one of your local institutions um, in the Harvard Business Review, they, they put out this, this article um, last year, the year before, uh, 2019, uh, and, and they just talked about the way that Black folks are still underrepresented in all organizations, right? And part of the reason is when you are part of a group that has been historically oppressed, again, whether that's your race, um, whether you're a person with a disability, a queer person, um, indigenous, um, what, whatever it may be, right? You have to figure out the ways of white folks. You have to figure out how the folks in charge operate. And that means that you're often code switching. You're often figuring out how can I bring my full authentic self to work but how can I still fit in? How can I dress the way I wanna dress? How can I talk the way I wanna talk? And how can I still be taken seriously? And so many of us code switch, right? And, and for many of us, that's why working from home was refreshing because you, you didn't have to quite be on in the same way. And, and people often say to me, well, that's not just, that's not code switching, that's just being professional, we all do it. But you have to realize that some of us do it more. It's, it's seen for many of us who are members of a press group is, is crucial for professional advancement. 
but it has this huge psychological cost. And, and if we're entering this space that, as I've said, is pretty white, we have to understand that there's just this group of us who feel like we can't be ourselves in the classroom, in the boardroom, right? Out in the field. Sometimes we feel like we can't even be ourselves when we're riding transit. We have to make sure we present in a certain way. I'll never forget hearing from a foundation director um, in the Bay Area that when her son asked if he could ride BART, their, their subway system by himself. And she was like, I don't know, I'm worried. And he said, don't worry, mom, I have a plan. I'll take a book and I'll read the whole time so people know that I'm a good black kid, right? We feel like we have to constantly be thinking about what the white gaze will think of us, right? And organizations stay white and fields like planning stay white because segregation is persistent. If you do planning, you know that. You know residential segregation is persistent, but so is organizational segregation. So is occupation segregation, right? In many organizations, whiteness is seen as a key credential for moving up. And, and don't be confused, like whiteness being being white, but also acting a certain way. There have been tons of research studies about women who talk about the way that to advance, they're often told you have to act like these other people in leadership. And you look around and everyone else in leadership is a man and they're like, just don't be so emotional. Don't be so moody, right? Things that they think are stereotypically women. So to, to act like a, a masculine patriarchal leader, you don't have to be a man. To have whiteness to move up, you don't always have to be white. It's easier if you're white but it's still seen as, as a key part of moving up, right? And if we're gonna talk about how to change our professions, we can't just keep having conversations about, well, that's just a bad apple, that's just one off. We have to first understand that diversity, equity, and inclusion are not interchangeable terms, right? Diversity is this. Uh, folks who have seen me speak before have seen this slide. Diversity is 90s clip art, right? Get as many diverse folks as you can and just sprinkle them in. Put that person in the wheelchair in front. Put the white guy in the back and make it pretend like it's hard for him to see. And then make sure we have lots of women. Laugh, be happy, right? But diversity isn't the same as inclusion because to get to inclusion, you have to talk about power, right? You have to shift power. You have to shift control. We can have diverse organizations. We can have a ton of diverse faces at the table, but if they don't get to make decisions, if they don't get to say, set budgets, if they don't get to say yes or no to projects or who gets admitted into this class, then do they really have control? And if you can't get inclusion, then you're never going to get to equity. And again, if you've, if you've seen me speak, you've seen this because I will put this in every presentation and say this is a, a great visual representation for many people who are new to the equality and equity understanding that just giving everybody the same thing doesn't help. But it's not a accurate picture because it's not reality of how we start and it doesn't actually get to where we should be getting, right? Why are we just trying to see over fences and over the barriers, right? That's not where we should be at. Instead, we should really be thinking about liberation. I'm not just doing transportation justice work. I'm doing mobility work. I'm doing liberation work. I'm doing abolition work, right? That's what's important to me. And even this picture still is tough for me because as I said, we have to talk about power. Too often folks like to talk about equity without talking about power. But who has the power to determine that what these folks wanna be doing is watching baseball? Look, I got on a baseball hat, I got on a baseball jersey, I like baseball. But what if these folks wanna play? What if they wanna own the team, right? There has to be some self-determination involved. And too often when we're trying to make decisions, we turn to data, not to people and their own self-determination, right? So why is data such a big deal to me? You know, that's a question a lot of folks should ask. And some folks may even be, be unconcerned with the presentation and just be really distracted 
with my casual attire today, right? My, my baseball cap and, and my jersey. What am I even wearing for the serious talk? Um, I'm wearing a hat from the Kansas City uh, Monarchs and a jersey from, from the Kansas City Monarchs. And the Kansas City Monarchs are a Negro League baseball team. So why am I talking about baseball uh, during a talk about transportation and equities? Well, one, as I said, I really like baseball. I like sports. Uh, I know for some people they're like, sport, what is the ball, right? But for those folks who like sports or like baseball or even casual fans, when you think of the best player of all time, there are some names that come to mind. Maybe you're not even thinking of the best player of all time. Maybe you're thinking of the best player right now. Maybe you're just thinking about a player's name who you recognize, right? And for a lot of folks, those are white men. And, and baseball is one of the sports that has really taken the lead on analytics, on using data to make decisions. So in some ways, baseball is like planning. We use a lot of data to make decisions. We use a lot of data to figure out the best route, the best solution, the best way to change our built environment, to help people, right? We use data. But something that's been coming up in the baseball world in the last few years is that the data that's collected didn't include the data of the Negro Baseball League, right? And when you do include data from the Negro Baseball League, we have some Kansas City Monarch players here, it starts to reframe who the greatest player is. See, data is powerful. It can help us do a lot of things, but I've already shown you data about who makes up our profession. I've already shown you data about who's teaching the future of our profession. We know that one of the tenets of, of, of white supremacy is that we really value data. And in fact, there's this belief that quantitative data is better than qualitative data. And we trust data more when it's created by folks who have certain qualifications and degrees and institutional backing. But again, I've already shown you the data of who makes up those institutions. And if we just create data in the absence of social context, if we're just collecting data without acknowledging that there's racism and not just racism, segregation and not just segregation, laws prohibiting perhaps some of the best baseball players from playing in the league, then what does our data really mean? Whose history is it? Who is truly the greatest player, right? That's why data is important because yes, it helps us answer questions and gives us a clearer picture, but we have to start asking critical questions. If, if data is gonna let us break down impacts on individuals and different populations, and if we can use data to decide where we need to go and help us figure out how we're gonna get towards those goals, then we have to know the dangers of it. We have to know that there are biases in our data. We have to think about who does the data represent? Who's represented and who's doing the data? Are we ground truthing the data with folks in the community? And are we truly understanding the difference between engagement and outreach? Are we just going out like planners love to do and saying, we're gonna do solution A or solution B, here's some stickers, tell us what you like. Or are, that's, that's outreach. Or are we doing true engagement? Here's what our data shows us. Does that reflect what you experience? What do you think is the problem? What do you think is the solution, right? Data is huge. I perhaps ended up in a PhD program based on a simple overreaction. I was working at a company writing for a client, a report about law and how laws have been used specifically pedestrian laws and biking laws, how laws have been used disproportionately to police people of color. And I 
you know, was working with a colleague at work and we wrote a lot of things down and the feedback we got, the red marks we got from one of the partners um, at our organization was these are opinions. These aren't facts. I don't see any academic citations. So perhaps I got upset and said, fine, I'll go get a PhD and I'll make some of those citations, right? So I get it. Like academia and data and field, re all of these things are important. But we have to understand that sometimes when you see data, you see numbers. And when I see data, I see people. I see stories and I see struggles. And I'm not just looking at transportation data to do my work. Because even if I go to a meeting to talk about transportation, the people who I'm talking to have so many other things going on in their life. And so as folks who care about any type of planning, any type of issue facing a city, we have to realize that progress comes through struggle, but you can't be a single issue person. You have to think about how these things overlap. There's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't lead single issue lives. Thank you. Let's do some questions. I'm still pondering the implications of all of what you said there, um, Tamika. Fantastic presentation. And mm -hmm. I, um, we do have a couple of questions and I'm sure there's gonna be more as we go on. Um, I mean, I wanna start off with Roberto Morales, Roman, who says professionalism itself is a white supremacist concept. So it's a statement, Roberto, rather than a, a question. Uh, Roberto, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Or would you like uh, uh, Tamika to just reflect more on it? Um, hello, um, Jess Growth Manager, Partnership for Southern Equity here in, in Atlanta. Um, thank you. No, no, I just I just wanted to say this is this is an issue that that I've I've seen come up a lot, even inside equity organizations themselves, yeah. right? Which which really seems to be a problem. And I love thank you so much, Tamika, for for speaking on it, right? But but when they you know when they they talk to us about being professional and acting certain ways and dressing certain ways, um, a lot of times you know we can get that from um, even executives of color, right? That, that they're not seeing how, um, you know, the, the, the concept itself so it serves to kind of replicate and, and, and cement, you know, these, these white uh, criteria or, or ideas of what work should be. So that's, yeah. was just kind of stating that. Thank you. No, thank you, Roberto. And I think you're absolutely right. I remember when I, I first went natural, my grandmother was appalled and she said, how are you going to get a job? You're, you can't go to work with your hair like that, right? And, and my grandmother loves me, but she really strongly believes that to be professional, you have to look a certain way, right? That's why things like the Crown Act are important. And, and we have to realize that, that there are things like a time clock that started on the plantation, right? So that we knew when people clocked in and clocked out. And so in organizations and in the work we do, we have to always be really, really critical with ourselves. Why do we think this is important? Why do we think this is professionalism? Does it really matter? Um, and really push ourselves. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Ezra Mataridi. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time today, Tamika. Could you expound a bit on the consequences we will see for both planners and the public if this vision, your vision, is not uh, fulfilled. I think about cities where growth is being fueled by white affluence. What does our future look like if black, indigenous, queer, transgender, gay, people of color, uh, insert other marginalized identities are excluded from planning processes? Yeah, that's a great uh, question, Ezra. I think it will look a lot like it looks, <laughs> right? Like, I, I think that, I think that what, what we see in our communities is not an accident, right? Um, part of what makes planning so powerful is this, this country we have that is deeply segregated. You're talking about neighborhoods, you're talking about schools, right? That was part of a plan. 
we we know this when you when you look at the history when you look at post world war ii right war the the war brought many people together for many black folks for instance we got factory jobs that paid well we joined the military right we had a taste of what it looked like when things were a little bit more equal but that's because we were needed but then after the war there were these government programs to help people build houses have homes build generational wealth, move out to the suburbs. Well, then we need highways to go out to the suburbs, right? So, so much of this was planned, but who didn't get those benefits? A lot of the folks you just mentioned. What did we do when we started talking about urban renewal and getting rid of urban blight, right? So now we see folks maybe coming back to the cities, as you said, as we're fueled by, by perhaps white affluence and kind of this, this reverse migration, but we're doing the same things. I think one of the most important things for people who care about planning to do is start caring about history and start owning the fact that our, our work has been used to perpetuate and further racism and exclusion. And if we don't start including some of these folks, all of these folks in the conversation, and not just at public meetings, right? Pay them, encourage them to get into planning. As a young black kid who cared about social justice, I heard be a lawyer, go into education, go into criminal justice reform. We need to start saying, go into planning, right? This is, this is the place to be. And I think when we acknowledge our history, we will understand that if we don't change it, we're gonna just keep perpetuating the things and, and it's gonna look a lot like it, like it already looks. Great, thank you. Olivia Burrell-Jackson is asking for a little bit more clarification on the difference between engagement versus outreach. Yes, so I think Olivia, the way I think about it is outreach is really, we're just reaching out to tell you what's going on, right? And we, and we all have been to those meetings. Um, we put up a public notice, we've gotten this funding, we're doing this project, here's what it's gonna be. And sometimes we ask for feedback, right? Do you, but the feedback is still very narrow. It's like, do you like option A or option B, right? And we're not ever truly transparent about hearing whether or not they like option A or option B is really gonna impact what we're gonna do in the end, right? The difference is with engagement, we still might go in with what we think is the solution, but we're open to hearing something different. So a great bike lane example. Outreach would be, we're making the street safe, we're putting in a bike lane. We can't decide, like in this community, right? We can't decide if we want it on this street or this street. What do you think? We wanna take your opinion, but also just so you know, we're leaning towards this street and it'll probably be this street. But we're coming here to tell you because we want you to know that you're not going to be able to drive here and blah, 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 right? Engagement is we've seen a lot of sidewalk bike riding and we don't want sidewalk bike riding. So we're putting in a bike lane. And then you go to the meeting and people say, I'm still not riding in that bike lane. I don't care what street you put it on. I'm not riding in the bike lane because this is a four lane street where people never follow the speed limit. There are no, like, there's just, there's nothing. There's no, the street has potholes, put a bike lane there, but I'll pop a tire, right? Okay, whoa, these are different issues. We're actually engaging now and we're actually getting to the bottom of it. So it's being open to a little back and forth and it's doing it with honesty and transparency because it also doesn't help people if you tell them you're gonna make changes and actually you can't, right? Like the funding says you're gonna do this. So it's a level of honesty and transparency and engagement that isn't always there with outreach. Hopefully that, that helps. That's great, yeah. And, and the second part to Olivia's question, how can institutions increase true diversity in the planning sector? Yeah, so I think all institutions, whether you're talking about a private firm, a government agency, an, an academic institution, I think right now equity is really sexy and people really wanna do equity work. And so they wanna to get to the results. Let's do equity and let's see what the results of doing equity are. And I think sometimes people aren't looking internally and saying, are we ready <laughs> to do equity, right? You can, you can be an institution that says we want more diverse people here, but then you a few years later, you're like, why don't they ever stay? And it's because you haven't necessarily done the work 
to figure out what about your institution is inequitable or racist or, or just really not welcoming, right? And so I think whether or not you're talking about institution or whether or not you're talking about it as an individual, we all have to examine what is that internal work? What is that system and culture and personal change we have to do? And then sometimes an activity I do with folks is circle of trust. And I ask them to write down in a professional setting, who are the five people you would reach out to if you ran into a problem that you really trust to help you think through something tough? And then I have people look at that list. And often it's people who are just like them, right? Same kind of educational background, same race, same gender. Um, and, and the reality is, I think often in, in planning, we bring people into the fold who we know, who we've heard from somebody, who we recognize something on their resume. And as someone who didn't go to planning school before now, let me be clear, you can do planning without a planning degree, right? Like, the, the homies hanging out on the corner every day, just chomping it up, can tell you everything you need to know about the speed of traffic on that street and whether or not the stop sign or the speed bumps are effective, right? And so we have to start understanding that like one, we have to do the internal work and two, we have to start thinking differently about who should be deemed an expert. There is absolutely knowledge which you can gain from learning and reading. But there's also wisdom. And there are many people who have wisdom. And if, if institutions can start valuing wisdom, um, I think that would also lead to a change. Great, thank you. Joyce Klemperer says, so interesting. I love the way Tamika ties it all together in spaces that all, aren't always examined this way. And I think that really is um, very powerful. Um, a question from Stefan. Building on Ezra's question, uh, wondering about the benefits for the broader community for better representation in transportation. What might you say to further show that all people benefit from better designing transportation for all people? Yeah, I mean, I think the classic example that a lot of folks use um, for, for this question are, are curb ramp, the curb cuts, right? Uh, curb cuts, um, you know, sure, might be part of our Americans with Disabilities Act, but many of us um, who are able-bodied have had a suitcase or have had a baby stroller or have had, you know, whatever it may be, uh, just having a, a, a tough day, a, an injury, whatever it might be, and that curb cut is just as helpful to us, right? And so sometimes people say, well, if we do this equity planning, it's gonna take longer, it's gonna cost more money, it, and it's only gonna help this specific people, right? And when we think about design, we have to design for the everyman. And too often the everyman picture that comes into our head isn't necessarily that person in a wheelchair, right? And so there, there are many countries who don't have those cu curb cuts. But I think this is a good example of when you plan for the folks who are perhaps the most oppressed, the most vulnerable, it really helps everyone. Now, notice I'm not saying a rising tide lifts all boats or whatever that analogy is, right? I, I, I don't always think that's the case. What I always tell people is if I'm in a little dinghy with holes and you know, just trying to get off Gilligan's Island, maybe I'm aging myself there, but if I, if I have this, this little dinghy and the tide rises, Beyonce and Jay-Z are going to be good in their yacht. They're not even going to notice the tide rising. But for me, I may completely capsize. That may be the end of my boat. So I think we both have to think about the folks who have been most oppressed and realize the way that when we plan for them, it can help everyone. But I think sometimes we can't get stuck in that argument um, I, I recently read a research paper where the person said, if we start planning and, and really focusing on people of wealth and affluence and getting them to love transit, transit will be better for everyone. And I, and I don't know that that's true, right? And so I think we just have to think critically about these things and ask ourselves those questions. I, I hope that helps. Stefan. Great. And I'm glad you mentioned the curb cut effect. It's really a, a very important policy principle. And uh, I think it was it Angela Glover Blackwell. Um, yeah, yeah. Policy link. Yep. Yeah, absolutely, fantastic. Uh, Socorro Shields needs some advice. Um, he, she, they says surviving government spaces 
as someone thinking about transformation and justice. Can you give me some recommendations? Yeah. So I think, you know, I think surviving any of these spaces, right? I think government has its has its drawbacks, but it has its benefits. Um, one of one of my best friends is is number two at the Department of Public Health in LA County. That's a big job always. That's a big job these last few years. And we were we were doing um, me and my team were doing a, an equity training for her her staff. And something she said to some of her staff that was feeling discouraged was government work isn't for everybody. It really isn't because it's hard and it's long. And in government work, you are working really long stretches for changes that seem really small. But when you make those changes, because it's government, it's really hard to change it back, right? And so government work might not be as sexy, but if you can change a procurement policy and figure out how to directly pay folks in the community, that is game changing. And it probably won't get changed back anytime soon, right? And so I think that first, no matter what space you're trying to go into, I always tell people to know yourself. Government isn't for me. I like to talk a lot. I'd probably get in trouble. It just wouldn't be a thing. So figure out who you are first. Don't just go somewhere because you want to make impact and someone else has told you this is the best way to make impact. Because if it doesn't feel true to who you are as a person, you're not going to enjoy it and you won't do your best work and you won't make your best impact. So first figure out who you are. And then when you're in a space, something I had to learn through lots of therapy. So therapy is also advice. But something I had to learn through lots of therapies, we can't save them all, right? And that's okay. And particularly for people who are, who are folks of color or queer or, or have a disability or part of groups who have been oppressed, the quote I always tell people is, you don't have to set yourself on fire to keep other people warm, right? You might change the world, but that doesn't mean that you're going to change that person. And you know what? all the energy you spend on that person or that agency or that department is energy you're taking away from your greater purpose of changing the world. And that doesn't make you a sellout. That doesn't mean you're not good at it. It just means that you sometimes have to choose you. So hopefully that's, that's helpful. Thanks, Tamika. Uh, we have a question from Lindsay Dowswell. Um, Great question. Environmental justice and equity dashboards are having a big moment in federal, state, regional, and local decision making. How can planners create and use dashboards that are responsible and meaningful? Uh, can these be good tools for public engagement and accountability? Absolutely. Um, I think you're right, Lindsay. Uh, dashboards are, are having a moment. I think a, a couple of things are, are happening. Um, particularly, and in, in I'll talk specifically uh, about transportation, but I think this applies to environmental justice, and I think it applies to, you know, equity indexes and, and, and kind of across the board, um, you know, and there are a lot of jurisdictions doing this. Um, San Antonio did, did this whole process where they came up with equity indicators, and then they're checking in every year. Um, so there are a number of, of different cities. Um, that sustainability report from LA County's Chief, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer and Sustainability Office, they have metrics and, and they you know, are keeping track of it. And then LA County just hired a new racial equity person who's supposed to put together a dashboard. So this is happening everywhere. And I think part of it is as technology grows, you know, government wants to use that technology. Again, specifically in transportation, we've seen companies disrupt uh, transportation. And I think cities in a lot of ways are trying to keep up. How can we also use technology to keep track of things? And so I think there are a few principles that are, are really important. And there are different, a few different groups that, that put out different principles. I did a project with the LA Department of Transportation when in their first year kind of of their scooter pilot. And we talked about different, different things that matter. And we talked directly with community members. So I think the first thing is in creating these dashboards and indexes, first talk to community people. I think it's a mistake when entities create them and only after that, then show them, right? We're gonna unveil this big thing. I think the process to get to the dashboard and what's in the dashboard has to include um, engagement, lots of it, and a lot of feedback. And both from you know community-based organization heads 
but also from folks in the community. And then the other thing is transparency and accountability. You have to keep saying transparency and accountability. I, I don't think if you do these things, but it's it's very you know hard to tell um, how the data is calculated, what gets put in there. So I think open source sharing and constant accountability, constant sharing, and knowing that you're gonna have to constantly update people. I think too often we just collect data from people, but then we don't ever tell them what we do with it. We don't ever tell them what decisions were made. We don't ever come back. And so I think there, it has to be an interactive process. So uh, hopefully that, that answers that question. Thanks, Tamika. So we have a question now from the Brown House Watch Party. And for your information, Brown House is where our main departmental offices are, or some of the main departmental offices. So there's a group of people watching in there. Um, they're wondering, what are your thoughts on methods of data collection, such as participatory action research and mixed methods research, that combines quantitative methods, which as you mentioned, sometimes dehumanize and qualitative methods that redistribute power to those who are most marginalized? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm this quarter I'm taking a, a qualitative uh, research class and I've taken some quantitative research classes. And our first, our first reading uh, for this class talked about the way that data collection quantitative are qualitative, right? And in fact, in many ways, qualitative um, data collection was the start of it, was all about colonialism, right? It was all about taking the other brown folks and studying them, pointing out why they were the other, why they were not as good as the white folks and, and creating data as to why you wanna change it, right? So I think no matter, and, and, and some people might have said that was the beginnings of participatory research, right? Like those folks who said, well, we're gonna go into communities and we're gonna integrate and we're gonna, we're gonna do an, you know, an, eth an ethno, you know what I'm trying to say, sorry. It's early here, but we're gonna go in and we're gonna be one with the community. Um, and so I think the first thing we have to do is ask why, why are we doing this research? And then I think we always have to ask, are we the best situated to do this research? And if we're not the best situated to do this research, then who is? And maybe we're the best situated to do this research this research because we have the resources or we have the educational backing, but we shouldn't be doing it by ourselves. So who needs to be on our team? And who do we need to pay for that expertise and time, right? So I think whether or not you're doing quantitative or qualitative, it could be bad, right? It can also be helpful. But you have to understand that, as I said before, data isn't just numbers. Data isn't just descriptions or coding. It's about people, it's about stories. And we have to, those of us who do research have to take our responsibilities well enough that we can't just solve problems because we've determined their problems. We have to really be willing and we have to have a, a framing of what is the community, who is the community, and I'm here to help not necessarily doing on my own. And that process starts from the beginning. With research too often, we like to go after and say, what do you think of my research? Is this helpful? And we have to start thinking about how we can start crafting those questions from the beginning with the people who are gonna be most impacted. Thank you. Michelle Meyer asks, how can we push institutions to offer more flexibility in funding? I'm thinking about nonprofits and putting money towards the actual solutions and allowing this to be driven by the people closest to the issues, as opposed to being limited to what is written in the grants. And this is definitely also applicable for government, academia, et cetera. Yeah, this is a huge problem. And I think this is one of the reasons a lot of people started talking about the nonprofit industrial complex, right? Because unfortunately, many NGOs or foundations have been instrumental and exacerbating some of these problems and making them worse. And so I think that we have to really start looking about the looking at the folks in power and who control those purse strings and start pushing them and advocating for them to think differently about how they fund. And, and that's like big picture, right? We need shifts and we need change. In the interim, um, what I hear from all of my professors that I admire and respect is you gotta learn how to write the grant you got to learn how to write the report and you have to learn how in between those two processes you actually do the work right and and that's different 
right? You write the grant, you get the money, you write the report at the end and you say what you've done, but you have to learn how to, how to do the work in the middle in the way that is, is most meaningful. And you have to cultivate sources of funding that have fewer strings. So you have to work on the now and you have to work on the change in the future. Great, thank you. One last question, and I think this is a really good question because I think it's one that um, you know we all grapple with. So uh, Georgia Gillen says, first of all, you're amazing, Tamika. So there you go. Uh, secondly, she says, it strikes me that a lot of people in organizations who prioritize equity don't actually understand or don't appear to understand that an equity framework necessarily requires different people to be treated differently in order to meet them where they are. Do you agree with that? And then she says, I think the idea of fairness is entirely underpinned by meritocracy, AKA white supremacy. Question, what are some steps you think we can um, take to reverse this mindset specifically through transit? Yeah, so I think something that we first have to realize is that we didn't get to this place of inequity overnight. And so it's gonna take a lot of, uh, a lot of work to get there. There's, um, there's a new book out um, about reparations um, and, I, and, it, and it really focuses on refer, reparations as a world making project. Um, and it's amazing. Uh, you should all read it. I'm trying to look up the name of it. Uh, Reconsidering Reparations by Olufemi uh, Tau, right? And he talks about the way that if we're gonna change things and it's not just about reparations, right? But if we're gonna change things, we have to realize that there was a world making process that le of imperialism, right? To shape the world and the powers a certain way. And so it's gonna be a long fight to redistribute and to come up with a more equitable system. And he talks a lot about the environment and that and why like the environment is, is a place to focus. But one thing he says is we have to constantly be asking ourselves, what kind of ancestor do I wanna be? Because my ancestors really fought for this. And did they give up just because it didn't happen quickly? No, they just moved the fight forward. And I think sometimes that's what's so hard about equity work. I think you are absolutely right. It's huge, right? It's, it's a mindset shift. It's like people wanna talk about fairness without acknowledging that nothing's fair now. They don't wanna acknowledge that people who have historically gotten the least have to get the most. And that means a different amount and that you might get none at all. They want a win-win situation. It's like, no, someone's gonna lose something, right? And, and that's tough for people. But as a result, people get so stressed out or they just think this is work they can't do. And too often they leave the work for the people of color, for the women. What I will say is, what kind of ancestor do you want to be, right? And you wanna be one who's just moving it forward. You wanna be one who is figuring out how in your space, you can make a little bit of shift because that's the only way we're gonna get this larger cultural change. What kind of ancestor do you want to be? That's a great place to leave this. Tamika, what a fantastic uh, talk. Um, I'm sure we could go on for longer. There's more questions, but people gotta to go to classes and we gotta go and do, uh, do things. So can we give a fantastic round of applause for Tanika Butler, please? Thank you. And um, on April the 20th, we have uh, Kyle White and Justin Schott, who are talking about the Energy Equity Project. Thanks, everybody. See you April 20th. Tamika, keep doing fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye, Bye folks. Bye.